Forgotten Faces of Titanic. Now, this week is the 109th uh, anniversary of the sinking of Titanic. And everybody, well, I would say most people have all heard the stories. You've heard um, the events leading up to the sinking. Um, this is an image here from our collection. We know that uh, the proper name of Titanic is RMS, Royal Mail Ship. You've probably seen tons of movies. There are books. So you have Titanic from the 1950s with Barbara Stanwyck, or you have uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's Titanic. They even made a Titanic 2, um, A Night to Remember. When you ask a lot of people, you know, to name some of the people from Titanic, you get names like John Jacob Astor and his wife, Madeline. Um, of course, Molly Brown or Margaret Brown, as she was known, uh, who eventually gains the nickname of the unsinkable Molly Brown comes up. J. Bruce Ismay, who was the president of the White Star Line, or perhaps Thomas Andrews, who was the designer of the ship. But there were so many more uh, passengers that were on board. Now, typically when you have Titanic programs, they usually happen on April 15th. But for me, April 14th is really the day that changed the lives of many. Um, there's lots of, we're going to get into a lot of information um, and try to share some of those stories with you. So well, let me take you back 109 years ago, April 14th, 1912. As I said, we all know that the Titanic is going to end up hitting an iceberg and eventually sinks to the bottom. But let's give you a few numbers. So aboard Titanic um, on, in 1912, on this April 14th, there were 319 first-class passengers. There were 269 second-class passengers, 699 third-class passengers, and you also have about 918 crew members. Keep in mind that the crew members are considered part of the third class. So the third class is going to be the largest onboard ship. And this was the ship that some nickname practically unsinkable. It was a boat of the best that money can buy, um, the lap of luxury, if you will. So that means that there were 2,205 total people on board the RMS Titanic. And not only the passengers, but you also have a number of crew members who are coming from all around the globe. So here listed, I've got some of the top ones. They're coming from England, Finland, Norway, Italy, Germany, Russia, Haiti, Egypt, Mexico, Uruguay, Canada, the United States, Spain, Cuba, Portugal, excuse me, uh, Cuba, Peru, Bolivia, China, Hong Kong, Argentina, Syria, Japan, Scotland, and Ireland. So they're coming, this is really, when we think about the story of Titanic, it is really one that is global. And we're gonna focus on some of these passengers. So let's begin with our first class passengers. And honestly, if we think about what first class, um, what people today in 2021, who would be considered first class, we're talking about the wealthiest of the wealthy or those who could actually afford uh, the uh, amenities that were aboard. Let me introduce you to Richard Norris William II. Now, in 1912, he was just going to be entering into Harvard, and he's actually abroad uh, with his father. They had taken some time for a family vacation before he was to start school. So on the night of April 14th, um, as the Titanic is striking the iceberg and there are passengers getting into lifeboats, he and his father actually were some of the passengers who ended up jumping overboard. Now for Richard Norris William II, he has a little bit of a double heartbreak because while he's waiting in the water, he actually watches his father get crushed by one of the um, 
one of the uh, smokestacks coming down. But he is eventually able to get into a lifeboat, but he's treading in the extreme cold water for a number of hours before the RMS Carpathia arrives. While on board the Carpathia, the doctors have said because of the amount of time he spent in the water, his legs would have to be amputated. He flat out refused. And so after months and months of um, physical therapy, once he returns back to school, it's amazing what this man goes through. So from 1913 to 1926, his tennis career extremely intensified. We're talking about world class. So in 1913 and in 1915, he won the intercollegiate singles titles. In 1914 and 1915, he won doubles um, titles. Again in 1914 and in 1916, he won the United States Nationals Men's Singles Championships. And then also followed it up with a championship in the doubles uh, category with a woman by the name of Mary Boone. He went and went on to do doubles at Wimbledon in 1920. And, and in 1924 at the Olympics, he won the gold medal in mixed doubles with Hazel Hotchkiss. And then in 1925 and 1926, he went on to win the United States men's double. So an amazing story for a world champion tennis player. Here we have Don Manuel Ramirez. He was from Mexico and he's in first class and he was a businessman. Now he was actually on the side of the ship that the officers were allowing passengers, uh, the women to get into the lifeboats first and then the men. As he was about to get into a lifeboat, one of the women that was on board uh, was in hysterics because she couldn't find her father and husband. And right then and there, Don Manuel decided to give up his seat to this woman. The only thing that he asked her was that she would find his family and let them know that he died with honor doing the right thing. The sad thing is, as history has gone on, um, research into her has found that this particular woman um, may have made up her story, that she um, did not have a husband or a father on board Titanic, but she did keep her promise and made her way to Ramirez's family and let them know of his brave sacrifice. We have Elizabeth and Mary Lyons. We have mother and daughter. So you have uh, Mary Lyons, he, excuse me, Elizabeth Lyons here, and this is Mary Lyons, who's the daughter. Um, they are actually traveling to the United States, uh, both son and their um, uh, Mary's brother uh, was graduating Dartmouth College. And so they were attending his graduation on the night of the sinking. Both women survived the sinking, and while aboard the Carpathia, uh, Mary actually wrote letters uh, to a friend letting them know what happened, and we actually have those letters here um, in our collection at the Mariners Museum and Park. Now, this particular image is from our collection. It is written in French, but it has been translated, and we do have that um, translation available uh, for anyone that is interested in seeing what that looks like, but they did survive. We have Douglas Frederick and, uh, excuse me, Frederick Daisy and Douglas Speeden. Again, this is another family that was on vacation. Um, at the time. And you've got young Douglas right here in the middle. Now, young Douglas, again, this family is um, from New York and they too were also on vacation. They were, had been uh, traveling to, uh, at Algiers and then eventually made their way into Southampton and then across the ocean. And Douglas was never seen without his little friend of his tiny little polar bear. Now, what's interesting for this family is they do get into a lifeboat. They do eventually make their way 
back to New York. But his mother, Daisy, had been a author and she was a very well-known author. And she decided to actually write a children's story but sh about the Titanic, but she wrote it from the point of view of the little polar bear. And the name of the book is called Polar, the Titanic Bear. Um, and sadly, uh, she wrote this, uh, sadly, um, she died in 1950. And I believe we actually have a copy of that book um, in our collection as well. Now we have the Allison family. So we have Hudson, who's the father. We have Bess, we have Trevor, and we have Lorraine. Now, this is another family that had been sailing to uh, Britain, and they were there attending a, a business meeting, uh, Tr uh, Hudson was, and this was a meeting for the directors of the British Canadian Lumber Company or a corporation. And as they are coming back on, this is a very sad story for the family. Because as they are making their way, like many other passengers, to the top decks uh, to try to get into a lifeboat, there was a little bit of a confusion. Bess and Hudson had Lorraine with them, but Trevor was actually with his uh, nursemaid, and they had all gotten separated. And so Hudson wanted to put Lorraine into a lifeboat uh, with, um, with Bess, but she flat out refused until she was able to find Trevor. She's trying, they're going all over the boat, trying to find him, never realizing that Trevor was in a lifeboat with his nursemaid. And sadly, Hudson, Bess, and Lorraine were lost when the Titanic sank. And Lorraine Allison is the only child in first class to lose her life. The family did eventually uh, make their way back to Canada. They are buried at Maple Ridge Cemetery in Ontario, Canada. And this is uh, the, the memorial to that family. And you can go all the way down the list here. Here is Hudson, here's Bess, his daughter Lorraine, who was only three years old. And you can see Hudson, uh, Trevor, the baby, um, died in 1929. Our second class passengers. Second class passengers are the ones uh, when you think of, if you think about the first class being the extreme wealthy, they included um, large corporation uh, directors, uh, presidents of organizations, those who we would consider as inherited money, um, or in the cases of Molly Brown, you have who her husband worked for a living. He was a, a very well-known engineer. Your second class passengers um, are going to be what we refer to as the middle class. So you have doctors, you have lawyers, you do have a smaller business um, owners, if you will. So there's a number of different jobs that would fit into this second class. So let me introduce you to Benjamin, Esther, and Ava Hart. Now, Esther is the mother to the right, and you have Ava who's directly in the middle. Now for this family, they are actually traveling from England and they're making their way to Winnipeg, Canada. Um, what's interesting is the family is going to board from Southampton. They're going to make their way to Cherbourg and then set out to sea after hitting Ireland. Esther Hart never fully felt comfortable being aboard the Titanic. She's been quoted as saying that it's a slap in the face of God to call anything practically unsinkable. And she was very fearful. She was so fearful that something was going to happen that during the day she would sleep while her husband and daughter would enjoy everything aboard Titanic. And in the evening time while they slept, she stayed up 
sewing and knitting, always ready to be alert in case of emergency. Imagine her surprise on April 14th when her fear came true, when the Titanic hit an iceberg. Sadly for this family, they are going to end up losing a loved one. Benjamin Hart was not able to get into a lifeboat, but Ava and Esther were. Uh, they eventually did uh, make their way to Canada where the family was going to be working, um, having a family business. But Benjamin Hart does not make it aboard um, into a lifeboat. Now, some of you may be surprised that there was uh, there were several people of color on board the Titanic. Um, I remember years ago where we would have students ask us, was there anybody of African descent aboard the Titanic? And I will sadly say, I used to say, well, no, there wasn't. But doing lots of research over the years, found out that was not true at all. So let me introduce you to Joseph Laroche, his wife, Juliette, and his daughter, Simone and Louise. And uh, so Joseph Laroche is of Haitian descent um, aboard in second class. He was a trained engineer. He had gone to France to study uh, engineering, and that's when he met and fell in love with his wife, Juliet. Um, they had two beautiful daughters. Now, sadly, at the time, um, those who are of color um, were having a little bit of um, trouble in France, uh, so much so that he decided to um, uproot his family and he was going to return back to Haiti. I will mention to you that Juliet is pregnant with their third child. And had they not gone uh, in April, they would not have been able to make their trip. So they decided to, uh, to go aboard. But for this family, they actually were not aboard Titanic originally. They had been aboard another ship. But aboard that other ship, there was a rule that the children could not be in the same area as their parents. So for instance, going into the dining room to eat as a family would not have been permitted. And so upon hearing things like that, they eventually would transfer over to the Titanic. But sadly, again, Joseph Larche will be lost. And depending on which historians you're looking at, he was probably the only person of African descent lost on the Titanic. Uh, Juliet, as well as her two daughters, eventually make it into a lifeboat. They're aboard the Carpathia, where they actually became friends with several other French-speaking families. They eventually make their way back to France where they lived in destitute for a number of years until the court cases against the White Star Line who owned the Titanic were complete. Um, eventually, um, she does give birth to that third child, which happened to be a boy, and I believe she named him after his father. We also have another family from France. So you have Michel Navatil along with his two boys, uh, Michel and Edmund Navatil. I will mention that um, multiple times that we've shown this presentation, we do have some people who would look and say, are those girls? They are not, uh, they are two boys. Uh, the clothing is gonna be much different uh, in 1912 as opposed uh, to what we wear today. But uh, Michel uh, Navatil Sr. decides to take his uh, children aboard the Titanic. He was actually going through something that wasn't as common as it is today. He was actually going through a divorce with his wife. Um, he was so broken up about what was happening that he did not let his um, wife or soon to be ex-wife know that he was taking the boys out of the country. And not only that, when he gets aboard the Titanic, he's on the Titanic under an assumed name. Uh, he went under the name of Hoffman. So on the night of April 14th, his boys were literally put into the last 
lifeboat leaving the Titanic. Uh, Michelle Nabatil goes down with the ship. But I want you to think about something. Their mother has no idea that they've left the country. Imagine her surprise when she opens the newspaper and on the front page are two familiar faces staring back at her. That simply says Titanic orphans. You can imagine her surprise, imagine her shock, her anguish. The White Star Line pays for her to actually come to New York City. She has to identify her boys. Um, she was able to do so by birthmarks that were on both children. Um, and she eventually brings her boys back home to France. We know that she did not claim the body of her husband. Um, his body was buried in a, a mass grave, I believe, in Nova Scotia. Third class. So if you've got the first class who are the wealthiest of the wealthy, second class who's right in the middle, the third class mostly were made up of those who were uh, migrating from one country to the next. And they all have their different reasons as to why they were aboard Titanic. But again, remember, third class is gonna be the largest class aboard the Titanic because it's a combination of passengers and crew. So let me introduce you to one of the chief bakers on board. You've got uh, Charles uh, Joquin. And you may have heard the story perhaps, but what's interesting is that on the night of the sinking, he figured that, well, he was not gonna be able to get into a lifeboat. So he began to drink and he kept on drinking and he pretty much threw deck chairs out um, off the boat. Hopefully people could grab onto them. It is said that as the, as the Titanic, when it split in two, the first half went down and then eventually the second half that he was actually holding on to the rails and is claimed that he pretty much jumped off the boat um, as it was sinking. He's gonna be uh, treading water. He eventually is able to swim up to one of the lifeboats that was in the water, but there were claims that there was not enough space for him to get in. So he's waiting around. He eventually makes his way to another lifeboat where he just holds on. Once they are rescued by the Carpathia, again, um, the doctors are gonna check him out, but unlike what happened to uh, William, uh, Richard Williams, it is said that because of the amount of alcohol that was in Charles's body, that kept his body from coming down with hypothermia. That is the story. Uh, he is going to be interviewed a little bit later as court cases on both sides of the ocean uh, go. And he does give his uh, testimony and he does admit to actually drinking uh, of what happened. He later goes on to serve on ships operated by America Escort Lines. And he also worked on a number of ships during World War II. We have Banora Yabir Dahir, and she is actually from Syria. And there was probably about between about 25 to 35 um, passengers of, uh, who were from Syria uh, coming across. And she's actually traveling along with uh, cousins, and she's going to be making her way to Michigan. Now she does survive, and this is an image of a number of the uh, women and children at Ellis Island, and this is Banura here on the side. Um, she later does make her way to Michigan. She gets married, and she has seven children um, uh, with her husband, which you can see here in the image. Um, what's interesting about uh, Banora, uh, it, and when I first heard the story, I, all I could do was just laugh, because um, what happens is her husband works for Ford Motor Company, 
her husband is a bit of a gambler. And he, as soon as he got his paychecks, he was out spending it. And I guess this happened one too many times. He came home with no paycheck. She went right down to Ford Motor Company, talked to his boss. I would love to know what she said because the boss started forwarding her husband's paychecks directly to her. So her husband had to go through her to get it. So pretty strong woman, but Benora, um, again, one of the survivors uh, aboard Titanic. Now, the Goodwin family here is one that is really one of the typical immigration stories of the time period. Uh, the Goodwin family sold everything that they owned so that their, new, their family could buy passage aboard the Titanic and start a new life uh, in the United States. They were actually headed to Niagara Falls uh, where um, Augustus, that's the uh, father here in the picture, had a brother who was working. Uh, there are actually eight members of the Goodwin family. There is a young baby that is not uh, in the image. Very sad story, but all eight members of the Goodwin family were lost aboard the Titanic. There's also a story of one of the police officers in Halifax who actually was helping to guard the bodies um, and the belongings of those lost aboard the Titanic. He's quoted as saying, clothing was burned to stop souvenir hunters, but he was too emotional when he saw a little pair of brown leather shoes, about 14 centimeters long, and he didn't have the heart to burn them. When no relatives came to claim the shoes, he placed them in his desk at the police station and they remained there until he, until he retired in 1918. If you go to Ellis Island, which I've been uh, several times, there is a room that just brings me to tears every time I go in there because on either side of the room, there's nothing but shoes. And it's the shoes of children that were lost aboard the Titanic. Now, something interesting as well is that as um, those who were lost aboard the Titanic were buried in parts of Halifax or they were claimed by family members, there was a memorial erected to a child that was unknown um, after the disaster. Now, throughout from 1912, there's been a number of anthropologists who had thought they had identified the child, but back in the 19 or I guess early 80s, late 90s, there was another anthropologist who was just kind of like, something just doesn't sit right. So he went back again and testing, uh, DNA testing with the remains as well as other family members they were able to track down in Europe, they finally have identified who this child was. And this came out a couple of years ago and the child has been identified as Sydney Goodwin. Um, so this marker, um, I don't know if this has changed um, yet, but they now know the child who is buried here. I mentioned there was also a number of officers uh, and crew members on board. So you have Charles Lightoller, uh, who uh, has, has had a long career uh, sailing the seas. He started at the age of 13 in 1888. He started off as an apprentice. And over time, he had been all over the world. And so he was, um, he had already survived one wreck in 1895. And then eventually he makes its way onto Titanic. And there's a number of stories about that he pulled a gun 
on some of the, the men, particularly who were trying to rush into the lifeboat that he pulled this gun uh, to keep them at bay. Uh, he does survive the sinking as he is one of the officers helping to lower the lifeboats uh, into the water and also paddling them away. His career um, on the water still continued even after um, after the sinking of Titanic. Uh, he goes on to where he is participating um, in a number of different ships. He was the first officer aboard the Oceanic. He was also uh, part of World War I. And then over time, um, he still continued his uh, duties. And then finally, we get down to some of you may have seen the movie Dunkirk. Well, at the bottom here, there is an image um, here where they're talking about um, a D-Day. And what's interesting is there's a story of a yacht that actually had went out and was pulling a number of sailors, excuse me, soldiers from the beach. Now his boat could only probably hold maybe about 10 to 20. He was actually able to get 130 soldiers into his boat and to safety. Um, and it is quoted that one of the soldiers on board when they found out that he had been aboard Titanic, he started to panic and said that we are doomed. And another soldier said, if this man survived the Titanic, then I know we're going to survive this. And uh, again, he uh, goes on and eventually um, he dies in 1946 at the age of 72. Oh, excuse me, I had the wrong date. Um, he actually died in 1952, excuse me. All right, we have another uh, crew member. This is Violet Jessup. And just like Light Toller, she is a career uh, person at sea. She had, has moved, she enjoyed working on a number of passenger ships, despite the fact that the salary was a little bit minimum. Um, she became an employee of the White Star Line in 1910. And she had worked on the Olympic, which is the Titanic sister ship. On September 1911, the Olympic collided with another ship, um, a British warship um, that was designed to ram ships. Um, even though the hull was breached, um, the, the ship was able to make its way to port and she was unharmed. Uh, a few years, um, then eventually she's aboard uh, Titanic in 1912. She survives that. And when World War I begins, she's aboard another ship by the name of the Britannic. So November 1915, she's aboard this ship and it also was attacked. Um, and she survived this one. It actually, it, this particular ship actually hit a German landmine um, that was planted. Um, the ship went down in about 57 minutes and she, um, and she retired. She eventually goes back to work for the White Star Line. And before she retired in 1950 from her life at sea, she had worked for two more cruise companies, the Red Star Line, and again with the Royal Mail line. There were also a number of people from, uh, there was a couple of people from uh, Japan, as well as laborers from China. And this was the only image that I've been able to find um, that has all of their names listed. They were listed um, on one ticket. Um, considered into the third class. Um, they were actually uh, traveling along, they were gonna hit New York and then eventually make their way back to China. But due to an, uh, some of the different laws that were in place 
uh, dealing with immigration and particularly those who are coming from various parts of Asia, uh, these men are going to face a number of um, issues of discrimination. Now, they do end up losing one of the men. Uh, the rest of them do make their way to China, but they are gonna be shunned when they got home because people felt that they should have gone down with the Titanic. Now, this, this story right here is uh, something that's near and dear here to the Mariners Museum and Park. Uh, this is Leah Axe and her son, Frank. Uh, this is an image of Leah and Frank uh, with, their, uh, with her husband, uh, Sam. Now, Sam actually had uh, left England and moved to Norfolk, Virginia, where he had been working in a number of jobs, one being a tailor, and he had saved up enough money to bring his wife and son over. Imagine again his surprise when the tight when he gets news of the Titanic um, sinking and hitting an iceberg. Now, Leah and Frank do get into a lifeboat, although they were separated for a short amount of time, but they were reunited. They make their way to New York and eventually they make their way here to Virginia. We have a lot of, um, we have several images as you can see, this particular image here is in our collection. We also have a number of newspaper clippings from the family because Frank Axe actually donated those items to the Mariners Museum. And this is an image of Frank and his mother at the 1950s um, release of A Night to Remember. This is a newspaper article uh, when his mother passed away. And they are actually buried, um, I believe it's Greenwood Cemetery in Norfolk. We have Milvina and Bertram Dean. Uh, Milvina Dean was one of the youngest passengers on board a uh, Titanic. They are traveling along with their parents. They had actually had planned to uh, return on another ship, but ended up aboard the Titanic. And what's they do survive, uh, her whole time family survives. And that makes Milvina Dean the youngest uh, survivor of Titanic. And it also made her the last surviving person from the Titanic. Uh, Milvina Dean died in 2009 at the age of 97. And between the years of 1912 and her death in 2009, she lived a very full life. Um, living in England during World War I and II, uh, she actually worked uh, in a number of different jobs, including um, doing a cartography. Um, so a pretty remarkable woman. Now, as I mentioned, she is, she was the very last surviving Titanic survivor. So even though today we have, um, we do have people that are, who are 109 years old last year, uh, about two years ago, I met a woman who at the time was 107. She was not a boy and she lives in Virginia Beach. Um, she was not aboard Titanic, but she does remember hearing the stories from various people and the newspapers. So it was very, um, it was pretty awful, awesome and honoring for me to be able to talk to somebody who actually lived in that uh, during that year and just hear her thoughts. That was an amazing experience. So as I started, there were 319 first class passengers 269 second-class passengers, 699 third-class passengers, 918 crew members. Again, 2,205 people aboard Titanic. I'm sure you've heard that the lifeboat capacity could only hold 1,178. 
keeping in mind that the Titanic, RMS Titanic, had more lifeboats on her than she was required to have by law at the time. But that is the capacity that they had on board. Out of the 2,205 people aboard Titanic, only 704 survived. And this just gives you a total of how many in each class. So out of the, um, the numbers there, you can see that the largest loss of life came from the third class. Remember that the crew was 918, and this is the number that survived. If you're someone who likes percentages, um, you can see here uh, the percentages that were lost in each class. So the first class lost 37%, second class lost 57%, third class without the passengers, 75%, crew members, 77%, and for a total, 68% of the passengers aboard the RMS Talk Titanic were lost when it went down. Now again, Tomorrow, April 15th, 2021, is the 109th anniversary of this sinking. And even though it's been that long, the legacy still lives on. We find it in the changes to um, the ships, changes in communications. The, we're still talking about stories. There's movies, there's more research being done into some of the passengers. Um, even some of the, the Chinese laborers that I mentioned, at one point, there was a possible film that was going to talk about their experiences and really get into their stories. So this is a story that probably will not go away. The Titanic today still sits at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean about two to three miles from the surface. Um, organizations, government officials like NOAA um, do go down to the wreck site um, to monitor um, essentially the, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, just the conditions of the ship. It's deteriorating pretty rapidly because of where it sits and their currents that are going overboard. It's a natural habitat. There's also companies who are taking um, outside of those organizations that are taking scientific dives um, down. Or you could be like this gentleman who is the Blue Star Line owner, uh, Clive um, Palmer, who was just named uh, to the Forbes list of uh, the wealthiest people in the world. He's on the list at 743 when I checked a few days ago. Um, he, for a number of years, has been wanting to fully recreate the Titanic. And this is a schematic of what he's looking at, of what he wants to do. This also was going to have a helicopter for him to travel on. Um, he even wanted to have a, a movie produced, and he's quoted as saying that the movie will be better than uh, Titanic that came out not too long, um, years ago. We have places like in Japan where they're doing a full-scale floating um, hotel that people could go on. So again, Titanic is still at our forefront, but 109 years ago is when this took place. And those are just some of the stories of those forgotten faces. Thank you. We wanted to thank you all for attending this afternoon. If you have not already had a chance to put your questions in the Q&A chat box, please go ahead and do that now. I'll go ahead and review actually with Siri a couple of questions that we received from Terrence Skelton um, in our neighboring Louisiana. Um, Terrence's first question was, 
Uh, was Juliette LaRoche white? And if so, was their biracial marriage okay in France or were they ostracized? So the answer um, to that, so yes, uh, she is white. She was French. And that was one of the many reasons why they ended up leaving. So um, in some cases, I guess it depended where in France that you're gonna be located, um, where this may be acceptable, but for the most part at the time, they're having that issue, but mostly because the fact that uh, Joseph was of African descent. And so he's also getting uh, discrimination that way in the job field. So with those two and a few other things that were taking place, they that was the best decision that they felt they could make for their family. So yes. Thank you so much. And, and Terrence's other question was, uh, of the shoes that were recovered at Ellis Island, were the bodies washed ashore? So some of the bodies, sadly, and I, and I apologize if this gets a little graphic, but some of the bodies were um, simply just floating in the water like you do see in a number of um, films. Uh, to my knowledge, there have been no bodies that simply washed ashore just simply because of where they are. Um, scientists and again, anthropologists have looked at um, how far the bodies would travel, but I haven't seen any uh, reports of bodies actually washing up on the sea that they could truly identify were from the Titanic. Awesome. Are there any other questions that may be out there? Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Great. And just again, if you do think of um, other questions sometime after this presentation, please feel free uh, to email us here at the museum. We'd be happy to uh, answer those questions for you. Uh, we also have a uh, Forgotten Faces blog that will go out tomorrow morning, and you can hear the story of another family that wasn't mentioned in the presentation, but they too have a tie to Harvard University. Great. Well, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you all so much for coming and in attending.